boy, they just don't lose them like they used to. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked on Baylor, brought to you by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. I'm your host, Cam Stewart. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day, especially after another gut-wrenching loss from your bears on the gridiron. It stunk, man. It stunk. 25-24, Houston wins it in overtime, right? Didn't go to a second overtime. And what I mean in the cold open of saying they don't lose it like they used to is the same sentiment I echoed in the heartbreak of Saturday. Like, why couldn't they have just lost it normal? <laughs> why couldn't they have just lost it like they did against Tech? If you're going to lose anyway, don't give us that hope. Don't give. Don't you dare give us that hope because there are people every week who are saying, Cam, you're, you're too negative. You're just, you won't say anything positive about this team. And still more are saying, how can you say by Wednesday or Thursday they're going to beat anybody. Whoops. And I really did think they had a chance slash kind of thought they were going to beat Houston this week. Like I had mentioned in, in last week's shows that I, I thought it was really the only, it, it, not a Sharpie win because you can't Sharpie in a win for, for this team against anybody, especially at home, but it was the most winnable game left on their schedule. And even, you know, you know, three, four weeks ago, we would have said this is a slam dunk. Baylor has to win this game. And even as Houston got better, it was still, Baylor should win this game. You know, they, they still should be winning this game, especially, again, where these two teams were two years ago and last year and heading into this season. There's no excuse for the Bears to be where they're at, of course, in the win-loss column. And to have this loss again to Houston. I'm going to get more into the game in the second segment, but really what I wanted to start with to pile it on is I wanted to look into just how bad this season has been for Baylor historically. Now, obviously, Baylor is no stranger historically to bad seasons. Um, it, it's been a while. It's been a while since it's been consistently bad. And it's been a while since they've been this bad because I look at the stats every week leading up into the game. What's the opponent looking like? And Baylor is once again, last in the big 12 in scoring offense and in scoring defense. And they have been there for quite a while now for a good chunk of the season, if not all of the conference season. And at least from that like 10 to 14 range in a lot of categories, but specifically those two, Scoring offense, scoring defense. So they score the least amount of points per game. They give up the most of anybody in the conference. And so I thought, when was the last time Bayward did that? Because, you know, 2020, their last bad season, um, last losing season anyway, you can say whether last year's was bad or not, but last last losing regular season, they were 2-7, and seven, Dave Aranda's first year, but they had a good defense. You remember, I mean, Terrell Bernard, Jalen Petrie, they were just as good individually as they were the next year but they didn't have the chance to show it in 2020 or, or put the nation on notice because the team stunk. But the defense was good. It kept them in some games that probably shouldn't have. The Oklahoma game is the one I remember. Anyway, um, in 2017, I thought, you know, they were bad. I don't know that they were quite that bad, especially the numbers I went off last week, that they were probably not last in both. They weren't. Um, they were, I think, second to last in both because Kansas was what Kansas was for that decade. Um, so I looked back, when was the last time Baylor finished a season, both last in the big 12 in scoring offense and in scoring defense. And I did have to go back a ways two decades. In fact, 2003 was the last time they finished last place in the conference in both of those categories. That's amazing. That's basically a Kevin Steele team. It's Guy Morris's first season. And we're talking like the dark days of the dark days for this program when they were winning like maybe a conference game a year, which they did. They won one conference game that year and um, they were terrible to put it into perspective. They lost to UAB by 15 at home in the opener. And then the next week they lost 52 to 14 to a university of Texas school. It's not the one down in Austin. It's the one in Denton. They lost to UNT 52 to 14. 
They won one conference game. They won one non-conference FBS game and one non-conference FCS game against Sam Houston State. They were three and nine on the year, which pretty almost pretty much nails this season. One FCS win, two conference wins, but they're uh, A, two first-year teams into the conference, and B, they're both pretty darn bad, like pretty darn bad. If you're going to put one team behind Baylor in the Big 12, it's Cincinnati, um, and that is half of Baylor's conference wins. So that's how bad we're talking. When we talk historically bad, is it the worst team that Baylor's ever had? Probably not because they've had some really, really bad ones. But this team is really, really bad. I mean, we're talking statistically the worst team we've seen in Waco for 20 years. And that includes some other, you know, three, four win seasons in there under Guy Morris. It includes, uh, you know, so slow start for Bart Bryles. It includes the two terrible seasons we've seen mixed in to the greatest seasons this program has ever had within the last decade. The one win in 2017, the two wins in 2020. That 2020 team, by the way, it, it was it was really bad. Don't get me wrong, but if they had had a non-conference schedule that year, they they probably win four or five games. And I know that's not a huge difference, but it's it's something, right? So even with those mixed in, this is the worst. This is the worst of those, and the worst that we've seen since before Sean Bell was a quarterback at Baylor, who is now the quarterbacks coach since he was playing at China Spring, which I'm repping for those people on YouTube. Uh, this is terrible. It's just terrible. And I went back deeper into the numbers. We all knew coming into the season, the four game losing streak at the end of last year and carried over into the season. But I wanted to break it down even further. And this might not be fair to some of you, but this is how I'm going to do it. I'm throwing out the Long Island game. FCS team. None of us knew they even had a football program. I'm throwing it out. I'm not counting that game. So let's go for the last year. Okay. The last season, the last 12 games against FBS teams. That stretches all the way back to before the losing streak, which was exactly 52 weeks ago. Um, it was the day I'm recording, November 5th. They beat OU 38-35. They didn't win a game again the rest of the season. So the last 12 FBS games for Baylor, their record, 2-10. and 10. A paltry 2-10. and 10. Outscored in that, in total, 386 to 247. That's an average of 32 to 21 a game. And I know there's people out there who are thinking, well, that's not bad. I thought it would be like 41 to 10. Over the course of a season against FBS teams, they are being outscored by double digits in every game, and they win two of them. If you think I'm going overboard by saying this is Kevin Steele bad, do you believe me now? This is Kevin Steele bad. This is, this is the kind of teams he was rolling out there. And Guy Morris, bless his soul, may he rest in peace, didn't do much better at Baylor. This is pre, like, this is almost as bad as it's gotten in Baylor's history. Now, it's a smaller sample size than those two got. Those guys got multiple seasons. But this is terrible. This is bottom of the Power Five type stuff. Like, I'm talking like the last team in the Power Five type stuff. And we talk about the first half struggles. They at no at two, they've had two games this season, two games against FBS teams. So again, throwing out Long Island, where they've had a lead at any point in the first half. I'm not talking about winning at halftime. A lead at any point in the first half. That is so embarrassing. That is so embarrassing. And there are arguments that I have to keep Dave and to keep this coaching staff around. But when I look at these numbers here, I struggle to find them. Because this is as bad as it can get for a program that is two years removed from a conference championship. The standard that we have built, that, that Baylor worked so hard for for a decade, is in danger of completely being pissed down the toilet. And we're watching it unfold in front of our eyes every week. Some people are, anyway. <laughs> there are not many that were out there. But there was one bright spot in this game, and I am so happy to highlight him. We're talking about our game changer of the week, which is brought to you by a sponsor of today's show, Athletic Brewing. 
look, if y'all don't want just, you want just the football hangover, right? You don't want the actual hangover. So that's why you go with athletic brewing because they have changed the game when it comes to non-alcoholic beers. They make great, great tasting beer that is also non-alcoholic. Tastes good. Don't have the hangover. I don't know what else you need. That reminds me of our game changer of the week, who is again, and not for the first time, not for the last time, quarterback Blake Shapin, who just willed his team to that overtime period when the rest of the team and their effort, they had just no business of doing it. I mean, the fourth down play, which I'll get to in the next segment, that saves, for the time, saves their season and saves their chances at a bowl game. Blake Shapin deserves more from his teammates than what he's been getting this season. And what you deserve more of is athletic brewing. Near beer, again, non-alcoholic, actually tastes good. They brew over 50 styles of craft, non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, golden, sours, and more. So whatever kind of beer you like, they've got it. And they're constantly releasing limited edition experimental styles to add to that variety. You can have them at any time, man. You can have them outside the Baylor game. You can have them at a wedding in South Bend, Indiana, on the golf course, in select classrooms. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, that's just because your professors might take it the wrong way. But it is non-alcoholic. It's near beer. No hangovers ever. You can find them in store or online and at bars around the country. But hey, if you're looking to do it online, I've got the deal for you. First time customers can use the code locked on to get 15% off that first lock, that first online order. That's code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N locked on at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer, exclusions and conditions do apply. So another chance for me to not only break down a bay or loss, but to wax poetic about Blake Shapin. And at this point, I really can't wax poetic enough about the guy. I mean, he is the one that we are seeing give the, the, the most effort. It's the one that we can see the most being the quarterback. And maybe that's unfair. Maybe there are other guys out there. It's tough to see it. Blake Shapin, ever since he's come back, has given everything to this team. Everything. And to be honest, I think he did that last year. The results just didn't come. And he was skewered the whole second half of the season, the whole offseason. Everyone, you remember the reaction when he was named the starter instead of Sawyer Robertson? who Sawyer could well be a good college quarterback at, at this point at Baylor someday, but he's not right now. And you saw that in the first couple of weeks of the season. And I think that automatically won some respect back for Blake. And he has just added to that tenfold since he comes back. His first game back, just the biggest comeback in Baylor history. He did that. He did that. And he has pulled this team up by its bootstraps time and time again. And this is why it shows that football is the ultimate team sport. He cannot do it by himself. And we're watching it, man. Every week, it looks like he is trying to do it by himself because he just doesn't have the help with him. The offensive line, mainly, but also the receivers, also the tight ends. I mean, Baylor was in danger of being shut out in this game. And Blake leads them back in the fourth down play. Was it fourth and 18, was it? I don't know because it's, I was watching on ESPN Plus. It said fourth and 38. So I don't think that was true um, on the eventual game tying drive to send it into overtime. Uh, and he <laughs> puts the team on his back. I mean, he does the scramble. This was such a Charlie Brewer play. Uh, scrambles, goes to the left, jukes out a guy, switches it over to the right, clear space in front of him. He was not sliding down on that one. Those are the kind of plays that you're gritty tough quarterback who doesn't have great skill players, doesn't have a great offensive line needs to make. And he made it again. This guy, I just can't say enough. It truly feels like us as fans, we're watching. He's the only one out there who wants it and leads them down for a game scoring, a game tying touchdown drive, and then takes the lead in overtime. I mean, quite literally Blake did all he could do in this game. The rest of the team let him down. And the thing that kills Baylor offensively, is, I mean, A, they, they stall out quite a bit. I mean, this is still not a great offense by any means, but it's, it's the empty trips in the red zone. And the two-play sequence right before the half looked like it was going to seal their fate. It epitomized the season. Um, Baylor does come back and obviously makes a game out of it, still probably should win the thing. But 
it's a seven to four point difference and they lose by a point. But it's the play where he throws to the to the front pylon back shoulder to Josh Cameron. Um, it's a it's a good throw. It's a beautiful catch. To me, it's a catch. Um, I I didn't I just didn't get a great camera angle at it on ESPN Plus. Um, I think they had said part of his helmet was out of bounds by the time he brought it down. It sucks. It was such a game of inches. It was called a touchdown on the field. That that's hard done. But then your kicker comes out for what a 32, 33 yarder, a glorified extra point, a little bit longer, and shanks it. Totally shanks it. It's not only on the momentum side, but just on the point side. You can't go down there into the red zone. As Baylor, you can't afford to do this, especially for a guy in Isaiah Hankins who we have seen make big kicks. You can't afford to get zero points. You just can't. When you're a team that's this bad, I don't care who the opponent is. They're in the FBS. They're in your conference. You cannot go down there and not get any points. That's just unacceptable. It's it's piss poor once again, and it ends up being the difference in the game in terms of on the scoreboard. Um, one thing that I was talking about with some of the people at the wedding I was at was, should Baylor have gone for two? and the win at the end of regulation. This is one of the things that, again, just totally epitomizes Baylor's season. I said no. I said no. Um, A, you're at home. You do that kind of smash and grab stuff on the road. I don't care how desperate you are for win. And B, I didn't trust them to get it. As much as I love Blake. (laughs) I didn't trust them to get it. How many times have I complained about this team on third down and short or fourth down and short and and the play calls and not getting the push? By the way, third down and short, they did have a pass to the fullback that absolutely worked, finally worked. So I'll give them credit there. But overall, how many times do I sit here and bitch about it? I can't be that guy who who does that and then says, oh, they should have gone for two. I don't believe they should have. I thought they made the right call. Then again, again, what epitomizes this season Is when Houston scores, I'm saying they're going to go for two and they're going to get it. The the, the UH fans should be throwing stuff on the field if Dana doesn't go for two here. You got a quarterback who's, you know, 6'4 bowling ball in Donovan Smith, automatic positive yardage. And I'm like, you're just going to go to him. And as soon as they, as soon as they split those guys out wide, I said, it's over. It's a quarterback draw. It's over. And I hate being right all the time because I am a pessimist sometimes, but it's exactly what happened. Quarterback draw, no way Baylor was going to stop that. Just not a chance in hell they were going to stop that. Thank God you had the fences down there to prevent a field storming, because that would have been more embarrassing than the loss. That's how far we've fallen. I love storming the field. It's great. Almost every win, almost every big win, you should do that. This was not going to be a big win. I, I am I am the guy who says no win is easy for this team, but I will also be the guy that says you cannot be storming the field against against this Houston team by beating them at home. And thankfully, we'll never know because they didn't again. Anyway, guys, this is really bad. I'm re- I'm very thankful we have Blake Shapin on this team. He is a, a genuinely a guy that you can build around at quarterback. But I don't think he has the time left for the for the rebuild that this the overhaul that this program needs. Is he Bryce Petty? No. Is he Seth Russell? No. RG three, of course not. Of course not. But you can build a program around him. You can build a team around him. I use the Charlie Brewer comparison all the time. You built the team around Charlie Brewer. You had a top ten team that went to the Big Twelve Championship, went to the Sugar Bowl. I know they didn't win them, but you can absolutely build a team around a guy like that. And we are seeing it week in, week out. He just needs some doggone help. And I'm really afraid he's not going to get it with the with the roster that they have and probably will have for his two years of eligibility here and with the coaching staff he's got right now. I just don't, I don't see it. But I'm very thankful for the effort he's putting out and the way he's trying to rally this team and the way he's trying to get them to not give up. And he might be looking for some new jobs. I would say the best way to do it is LinkedIn Talent Solutions, another sponsor of today's video. Please don't look at other jobs, Blake. We would love to have you here, please. We'd love to have you here a long time. 
But LinkedIn Talent Solutions is the way to do it. It, it is the only way you can feel 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. LinkedIn Jobs and LinkedIn Talent Solutions is the way to do it. You add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile and spread the word that you're hiring. They use simple tools, things like screening questions. Yeah, other companies don't use that, which is crazy. Uh, it makes it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's exactly why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So they help you find those qualified candidates. They help you do it faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions, of course, do apply. So looking ahead, as we so often do with Baylor, the margin of error was very slim to begin with. It is zero now because the loss puts Baylor at three and six. Any loss from here puts them out of bowl contention. Ah, and you don't have the easiest stretch to end the year. <laughs> Next week at Kansas State, who just lost a heartbreaker on the road, so they're going to drop out of the rankings. But still, it's a darn good football team. Capable of being a really good football team. Then you got TCU away the week after that. Another team scratching and clawing for bowl eligibility and one that I think probably has a better core and a better coach than you and has the home field advantage and has the advantage of they beat the crap out of you every year. They beat you every year. That's another advantage. And then they play West Virginia at home. Don't know. West Virginia's a total wild card to me. If Baylor, by some act of God, is 5-6 and six going into that game, I'd like the Bears, even though it's at home. But I don't see that happening either. So there's a, there's a good chance they lose the next three down the stretch, and I wouldn't be. Totally surprised. But looking at Kansas State, this this is one of the top teams in the conference. Um, they're coming in a little ticked off. Um, they see themselves as, you know, needing needing a lot of help, but still in the race to qualify for the Big 12 championship. They need a lot of help. But this is a proud team, a very well-coached team, and a team that plays well at home. And Baylor, while they play better on the road than they do at home, that's not much of a benchmark. It's not much of a benchmark at all. And if last year's game was any indication, which I thought was a, a better Baylor team than this year against a, a good Kansas State team, probably a little bit better than they are right now, but talent-wise, I think just as good, add in a Deuce Vaughn. And that was a game that Baylor needed to show up. They needed to win to keep... this Again, this was November of last year, by the way. And they had the chance to... They had their destiny in their hands to go to the Big 12 championship game. First game, night game at McLean for the first time in years, probably since 2020. Um, a, a, a jacked up atmosphere. The black unofficial blackout looked awesome. And they came in and played their worst game of the season. Absolutely laid an egg. Kansas State put their open mouth on the curb and stomped them to death. 31 to 3 was the final in that one. And it didn't even feel that close. This that was the start of the Baylor that we know now. You know, they had a pretty good week the next week against TCU, but they didn't win, and it's just been all downhill since then. I think we could see something like that again on Saturday, unfortunately, and I and I I would love to have talked myself into it um, by, by Monday. Um, I don't think it'll happen by Thursday either. I think this is a Kansas State team that does see a window of opportunity to hopefully get back to the conference championship game. Total long shot, but still there. And just a team that beats up on, on lesser teams. And I know that seems like a, a simple, almost backhanded compliment, but it's not. When, when they play inferior teams, they beat them, and usually pretty handedly. And that's something that's not always easy to do in college football. And, I mean, shoot, ask UT fans. Most years in this last decade, they play down to their competition. Um OU, I, I think Kansas is a good team, but I thought they played down to their competition last week. I think Oklahoma State might well be a better team at this point in the season than Oklahoma was and a well-deserved victory for the Pokes. Kansas State plays these lesser teams and they knock them around for three hours. They put them into, pummel them into submission by halftime. That's what they did against Baylor last year. I think they're going to do it again. Um, this is a tough team. 
This is a well-organized team. Um, good defense, although uh, they didn't show it for much of the game against UT. And a, a relentless effort that they were down 17 twice in that game in Austin, and they came back and lost in overtime. Um, they are, again, well-disciplined and well-coached, but um, that's slang for they're not very pretty. Um, they have an efficient quarterback. They've got a good run game. That offensive line will knock guys around. And I love what they get out of the tight ends. And that's something that's killed Baylor over the last couple of seasons. Obviously, we know they cannot stop the run if their lives depended on it. Um, they are the second worst rushing team offensively in the conference. Thank God for BYU. We appreciate you guys. But they are still the worst rushing defense in the conference. Um, and that gap is widening every week. Uh, I just can't see Baylor, A, scoring enough points um, to beat Kansas State because, B, I, I, don't, I don't think they're going to have the ball all that much. I think Kansas State's going to run it down their throat. Uh, Baylor has an inability to run the football. And I think we are once again having the same discussion next week of looking at a coaching search. And one last thing before we get you out of here for today and we stop the misery for the day because we're talking basketball tomorrow, which I just can't wait for. Um, but looking at I look at I look at a couple teams each weekend now, and you can tell me the theme as to why. UTSA won again this weekend. They beat North Texas six and three on the year, five and zero oh in the conference. Tulane won again. They've won seven in a row. They're eight and one on the year, five and zero oh in the conference. Marshall, thundering herd. They have been just beating the crap out of teams up until uh, yesterday or Saturday. As you're listening to this, they lost big to App State, but the week before, um, uh, they, they've, they've been up and down this season. So not as good as those other two that I've mentioned, but something to keep an eye on. Texas State won again. G.J. Kinney has them bowl eligible. No particular reason, just looking at those scores. Anyway, guys, thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. It's so close to basketball season. We tip off on Tuesday, so tomorrow is going to be a preview episode on what to look out for, both from Baylor and the Auburn Tigers. Good test. Good test to open the season. Auburn just outside the top 25. That's a team that's going to be in the rankings this year. I guarantee that. And they've got some talent that could cause some problems for Baylor. But Baylor's really good and really deep. But that's for tomorrow. Thank you again for making it your first listen today and every day. We'll be back. This has been, always will be, Locked on Baylor.